uh, plenty of time. So, and we'll probably take a little break, bathroom slash drink break or whatever in between the two talks as well. So, so yeah. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce my recap. Uh, my recappers. Um, so, uh, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Eric Brin, uh, Ember Core team. Live in uh, Oakland. Uh, organize the meetup. Drive all the way down here to organize it. Thankfully, Feather has offered to help organize as well, so we'll have somebody, a local organizer as well. Um, Jay Phelps here is an engineer at Netflix. He's a member of the Ember community. He also has a bunch of experience writing React and have you done it? You're really into like web components and graffiti. Oh, yeah, wrote graffiti, the uh, universal what component uh, system? Is that, is that the tagline? Anyways, um, Jay's awesome. Um, thank you, Jay, for for offering to help. And uh, let's see, we'll go in order of of speaker. So Nathan Hammond uh, is another kind of uh, prolific member of the Ember uh, community, Ember CLI core team, officially now, I believe, as of EmberConf. Um, and uh, he's an engineer at LinkedIn, uh, helping kind of drive Ember adoption in LinkedIn. So thank you, Nathan, as well. And then we've got uh, you know the man. The myth, Stefan Penner, creator of Ember CLI. You can thank him later. Um, and uh, he's going to be recapping his own talk. We, <laughs> we messed with the order a little bit so that he could recap his own talk. Um, and uh, the talk's after his. Um, so thanks, Steph. He's an engineer at Yahoo. They pay, Yahoo's great, they pay him to basically work in Ember CLI for a large majority of his time, as well as Ember. So Ember CLI, Ember core teams. Uh, Steph is on. And then we've got Josh Lawrence, who is an engineer at LinkedIn. Um, relatively new to Ember as of how many months now? Yeah, like nine. Nine months, okay. So getting, getting experienced. Um, and so uh, he's going to uh, be our last recapper, and we'll uh, cover the last six or seven talk. So thanks, it's like, Josh. It's like 20 uh, framework years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's gone from Ember to Angular to React, now back to Ember in nine to 10 months. So thanks, Josh. Uh, that was a joke, by the way. He didn't actually do that. Um, but <laughs> it's actually true. OK, great. Um, so, so yeah, without further ado, um, I'll get things started, I guess. Um, you guys can have a seat, or if you want to hang out on the side, feel free. So. Um, we always open EmberConf with a keynote from Tom and Yehuda, and you know we've had, I think now this is the fourth Ember conference that we've had, uh, kind of official Ember conference, um, and so uh, Tom and Yehuda always do a good job of giving a Steve Jobsian, uh, you know, kind of performance, talking about uh, where we're taking the framework and uh, you know interesting and notable things, and I think kind of the big thing that uh, I would like to point out is that kind of, you know, last year I think stability uh, without stagnation was kind of one of our important taglines to kind of communicate Ember's, um, you know, commitment to moving forward and progressing and taking on new ideas, but still having backwards compatibility and following Ember and stuff. And now this year we're kind of promoting the idea that Ember's the SDK for the web. And so we're going to try to keep making uh, things like, uh, adding service worker and app cache support in your application, very easy to bake in, kind of you know, one line installs or very easy to bring it in, maybe even included as a default in Ember CLI, kind of making Ember the first class platform for building web applications. And um, the other big obvious news that most of you have probably heard about as well is on the announcement of our Glimmer 2 rendering engine. And so Glimmer 2, uh, in a nutshell, brings uh, many X's of performance uh, increases to Ember. So I think uh, the dbmon uh, benchmark that was uh, highlighted last year when we announced Glimmer version one, we're two times faster now at that benchmark. And then there's a new benchmark which renders thousands of component, a thousand components at a time, and I think we're three times faster at rendering that with Glimmer two than we are than we were with uh, Glimmer one, and we're actually now. Uh, I think something like three times faster than React at doing incremental rendering. Um, we've also brought a bunch of, it's also brought a bunch of improvements to initial rendering time. Um, and so I think we're close to 2x faster initial render now with Glimmer 2 from uh, Glimmer 1. So basically your Ember apps will boot twice as fast, hopefully. Um, so that's great. Um, fast boot is also 
progressing quite well. Fastboot, emberfastboot.com has launched. You can pretty much, I've played with it myself. I highly recommend you play with it as well. You can basically Ember install Ember CLI Fastboot and you can deploy your Ember app up to Heroku in like two lines of code and now you've got our server side rendered app, Ember application that can give your apps SEO uh, out of the box. Uh, basically, very cool. Ember uh, Fastboot 1.0 is going to be uh, coming out with Ember 2.7 in a, in a couple months, I guess. Um, so, again, related to the SDK for the web, I'm running. I'm way ahead on way over time on this slide, but it's the key. It's the opening keynote, so I guess why not? Uh, progressive Web Apps Initiative. Basically, we were, we uh, we built a little Ember Conf scheduling app to kind of show off how we could potentially give you, uh, you know, uh, improve your second boot experience to kind of make Ember more competitive with the idea of native applications. So like. People put up a big interstitial. They tell you to go down there, download their native app. And the reason for that is then it becomes faster for you to kind of reopen the app over time. You get a better perform, uh, you know, better performance, uh, better experience. Perhaps we've we built a very simple um, scheduling app that uses an add-on that we also built uh, that basically lets you deploy uh, with basically offline support for your application, so that the next time somebody comes. If your app hasn't been redeployed since the last time they were there, they'll be able to use uh, reliably cached assets to boot up your app without having to go over the network at all. Um, so basically increases the second boot time significantly. You don't have to re-download the app or you know, if you're on a mobile, you can't really trust the HTTP cache, et cetera. Um, we also announced two new core team members, uh, Dan Gephardt and Godry Chan. Uh, we have sub teams now. We've kind of formalized sub teams. So there's core teams now for Ember CLI, the learning team, and also Ember Data. And that's all for the opening keynote. All right, now I got to go faster. Um, so, second talk of the conference was using service workers in Ember. Great talk, kind of covering service workers at a whole uh, as a whole. Whole bunch of great links here. I'm not going to do it justice because I'm so long on time. But one thing that's really cool to check out is hospitalrun.io. It's an open source hospital information system built in Ember. So if you're looking for a great uh, example of an offline capable Ember app, go check it out. It's just not on GitHub. Um, there's, they're also doing some very cool things like adaptive data fetching. So they basically detect like if you're on a mobile app, uh, if you're on a mobile phone or if you're on a, I'm not actually mobile phone, if you're on like a 2G connection, they'll download less records when they're fetching, you know, like paginated data sets. So they're kind of doing some cool stuff. You can check out the code examples um, and their approach. It's all open source. Um, and they're also looking for volunteer Ember developers. So if you're interested in getting involved in open source or you're trying to you know, up your Ember game, potentially working on their app is a good way of, kind of getting your, uh, your hands dirty in a fairly complicated Ember app. So. Um, then uh, we had a talk by Chris Ball call, uh, that was called Cross Pollinated Communities. We all win. And basically, this was a talk that kind of detailed a bit of history around Ember. Some of the uh, Ember came from a framework called Sprout Core, which was primarily kind of uh, built and maintained by Apple for the mobile me and uh, iCloud products. Uh, so Ember kind of became, was Sprout Core 2 in the past life. And uh, we kind of uh, forked from the Sprout Core community, created Ember. We've taken good ideas from other communities. Other communities have taken good ideas for us. For example, like Angular 2.0 now has a CLI tool that's based off Ember CLI. So they basically just took our project and relabeled it, Angular CLI. Uh, and they've been doing great work to also contribute back uh, to the uh, Ember CLI and Broccoli communities. And so it's an interesting talk if you're interested in kind of understanding a bit more of the history behind the project and also you know, how Ember is helping to shape the web development industry as a whole, software industry. Um, next talk, this is actually, uh, this talk's called Selecting Good Ember Patterns. Uh, this one uh, rang uh, home for me because I wrote the original Ember Select implementation, uh, which lived a long life and had some bugs and uh, we've killed it in Ember 2.0. And so, um, uh, Brianna, by killing it, we put it out of its misery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, Ember Select was a pri and, and sh she does a great uh, job of kind of explaining kind of the trade-offs here. But Ember Select was a monolithic component, effectively, right? It did. It wanted to manage the rendering of the the select uh, dropdown completely, and so it had a lot of configuration to be very flexible in its rendering. And nowadays, with HTML bars. Um, and uh, some of the improvements we've made uh, to our rendering system, you can basically just build a select using an each, 
and you can do data binding directly to properties in the HTML. And it turns out you can also do some nice things uh, by wrapping that HTML in components and building, uh, kind of taking a composition. It's a great case study in using composition over using kind of monolithic components. And so actually, uh, I was just uh, advising somebody on how to build a select the other day, funny enough, and I was like, whatever you do, don't build the select that renders all the options itself. Just let people each over it and have an option component if you need one. Um, it's going to be, because basically there's just tons and tons of edge cases with this stuff. People want to do option grouping, they want to do disabled, they want to, you know, add their own custom behavior and basically you're going to spend a ton of time building a monolithic component that can do all these things versus just letting giving people nice primitives that can let them build the component that's maximally flexible and can do everything they want very simply right um, and so she also covers a lot of great new technologies that you may not be aware of things like closure actions the get helper the mute helper and they have actually released she works at ted uh, as in TED Talks, and they've released, their, they're building a bunch of internal apps at TED using Ember, and they've released their select implementation under TED Select, so you can check that out as well. Um, next talk uh, was actually one of the ones that I went to myself, an illustrated guide to Ember, and um, this was a story of a new developer, like somebody who actually uh, works for a company that's uh, primarily focused on the education market. She was a teacher prior to uh, doing software development, learned how to do software development and used Ember to kind of build one of her first web applications. So a very interesting perspective there. Uh, kind of went over some of the UI challenges faced by her team, things like uh, performance constraints and how, uh, and how they solve some of those things, including things like pagination. Uh, and it was just kind of like a, one of those great kind of lessons learned talks. If you're somewhat new to Ember or you've you know, built a project and you're kind of like, it's a good retrospective kind of talk, you know. Um, and so if you're interested in that, definitely check it out. A lot of great illustrations as well. Obviously, the name of the, the talk's Illustrated Guide. She did a lot of beautiful illustrations um, to kind of tell the story of, you know, her experience building her first number app. Um, and uh, my, last, my last slide here, my last talk to recap, uh, really cool talk by Felix uh, Raisberg, who works at Microsoft. Um, and uh, Microsoft's using Ember quite a bit. Um, he c talked about Electron and building desktop apps with uh, Ember and Electron. For those of you who don't know, uh, Electron's basically the technology behind Atom. Atom's built with web tech. Uh, there's a native kind of, you can think of it as like the PhoneGap or Cordova, but for desktop, that's Electron. One line install, Ember install Ember Electron. You can immediately then run Ember Electron, and that's basically like running Ember Serve, except it's booting up the app inside of a native app shell. And so it's got live reload in there. You can start building, you know, your Ember app is something that you can redistribute as like an exe or dot app for, you know, Mac, uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac. Really cool. Has test support, everything. So check out that talk if you're interested in looking uh, in learning more. So that's all for me. Jay, you're up next. Thank you. Hello. Oh, I already skipped the slide. There you go. Okay. So the first talk I'm going to talk about is how I learned to love Ember. And basically, it's the story of a person who went through a lot of JavaScript fatigue. He started off, actually, as a Rails developer, did a ton of Rails. Their team decided they were going to port the Rails application to a single-page app using Ember. And at first, he basically was a little... Um, he felt that it, Ember was a little too complex. It does a lot for you. There's a lot of things you do need to learn. But he realized that basically um, he, had a, he had a quote from Zen of Python, which I hadn't heard before, which is simple is better than complex, but complex is better than complicated, which just ultimately means if you're trying to build a fairly complicated uh, or fairly complex, I guess, if to be more specific, uh, application, kind of like Gmail is. He gave the example of Gmail. You're going to have some complexity. You have to have that. So you've got to get over that hump and, uh, and learn the actual tools at hand. And once he did that and committed to Ember, he found uh, that it was a great experience. And uh, basically, it was a big story about how he initially was hesitant, but then current came to really love Ember. So I recommend checking it out. It's one of those good feel-good uh, uh, talks. The next one is uh, building mobile applications with Ember, and this is uh, this goes over the Ember Cordova package, which is actually a, used to be a fork of Ember CLI Cordova, very similar names, but ended up the old one uh, isn't as maintained as this new one. And he gave basically an entry level about how to create one. Then he dove into some 
common caveats of, of using such a system. Being very careful about memory usage, uh, your app size, and particularly reflows. He gave some solutions uh, about certain problems, uh, using Hammer.js for touch handling, using smoke and mirrors for infinite scrolling, liquid fire for animations, and then a project called Crosswalk uh, for enabling additional optimizations. The next talk is uh, Living Style Guide Driven Development. And uh, the basics on this is that if you haven't heard of a style guide, um, it kind of assumes that you generically know what a style guide is. But I'll run through that really quickly. It just basically means a, a Bible of the style you're going to be applying and using. So it's a single place where you can go. And for the most part, you all the decisions about certain common styles are already defined and conventionalized. And with the Living Style Guide, he basically takes it a step further and creates an add-on, which you, you yourself can install and then extend um, to create this style guide that actually runs against an Ember app. And it's a very basic Ember app that lets you demo through the different things. You can see, um, I have a demo here. It's kind of quite hard to read, but um, he's got freestyle palette tile, and he's got font selections and buttons and all sorts of stuff. So similar to like a bootstrap type of thing, but you have a centralized location that you can run in your actual app to verify that all these things work and look correctly. So if you have a designer, or even if you don't, anyone can come here and say, this is is what it's supposed to look like and or you can select like oh should I be using a medium button or a large button or whatever you just have conventions around that um, kind of playing off the idea of Ember having really opinionated conventions having a style guide around that and uh, since it's the same exact code base it's not like a duplicate it's living in the sense of the same code that you're running this in is the same code that's actually in your app it's not booting your app but it's the the style itself is the same and the components around that so if there's a regression you can always come back here or you can even write tests against this to uh, verify that there's no visual or, or technological regressions the next one is uh, warp speed memory management, and uh, he, he uh, she, excuse me, she starts off um, basically saying that you know, JavaScript developers are not immune to memory issues, even though it's a garbage collection collected language. Um, so you know, she mentions that like garbage garbage collection pauses are often uh, the problem. Uh, she gives a couple uh, recommendations like uh, avoiding globals, excess allocations. You should batch your DOM operations, things like that. And uh, she does mention that Ember protects you from some of the most common leaks. Like it'll clean up your components when you when you uh, leave that route, and 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 uh, you know it used to do singletons for certain things, but it doesn't do it doesn't prefer to do those things anymore because of the memory issues associated with that. And she gives a little tip about that uh, she has found that observers are often a cause, uh, not the observers themselves, but the code you place inside the observers are often the cause of uh, memory leaks. So try and use computer properties in general. The next one is debugging Ember with empathy. And she basically creates a, a, an app and runs you through some of the, the, uh, the bugs that she had found with the model hook of, of, of Ember's route handlers and explained her thought, press, excuse me, thought process for going through and debugging those issues that uh, she had seen. So she gives, gives some tips like re recognizing that code has a perspective just like humans do. And computers, you know, ultimately computers do what we tell them to do, even if obviously, and when I say mostly, that just means that someone else may have written that code, not you. So, <laughs> and uh, you know, use debugger statements. Use you know, like don't you know, when you're when you're going into debugging, stop the world and find out what is the perspective of my application at this point in time. Look at the state. Um, use it also to verify that code you think you really believe this code is running. Maybe it's not. That's actually the case a lot of times where you believe some code is running, but it actually is never reached. And so you can save yourself a lot of time by putting in debugger st statements. Um, also follow stack traces. This is something that everyone should be familiar with. And uh, the next one is di dissecting an Ember CLI build. And uh, she, she dives in and uh, actually explains the, the, the latest architecture of Broccoli, which is the uh, asset pipeline library that Ember CLI uses under the hood. And it's actually really fairly technical, especially if you're not previously familiar with Broccoli. So I, um, if you're very interested in that, I definitely highly recommend uh, you take a look. But it's kind of difficult to uh, sum up. But some big takeaways is that they used to use the term tree, which is a directory of files plus a plugin. Now they're using the term node. Um, and uh, there's this. Uh, there's that, but I'm not even going to go over that. Um, you can compose Broccoli plugins. And uh, it, basically, when you're running through and doing your build pipeline, it, it, it concatenates each node. Um, 
which I don't know what I meant by gets to public and merges, but basically there's a, there's a chart on, on the right which you can see where the different uh, nodes, not trees anymore, get basically concatenated together to produce the merged output. Um, again, it's fairly technical, so if you're interested, definitely check it out. Next up is Nathan. Got a mic. <laughs> Magic, Look, no hands. <laughs> um, which it actually just means that I get to wander around and look like a goofball because that's what I'm good at. Uh, so uh, my first talk is uh, actually from my colleague Chad Hayatala over at LinkedIn. Uh, and he's talking about building Ember apps at scale. And at scale means uh, for hundreds of millions of users with a couple of hundreds of developers. So th the problems that we're solving aren't just uh, how do you build an application for a large audience, but also how do you build an application with a huge team? And so one of the things that we discovered was that in a late stage product, we know what we're up against. All you're gonna build is that same application over and over and over again. And so it's really important to have a unified approach to building your application. Um, and so something like Ember, especially as we're now considering it like an SDK for the web, really makes sense for the consistent rebuilding, reworking, having a solid foundation of your entire application. The other thing is that we have uh, taken our uh, fast boot mode and uh, given it a kind of quick shot of steroids. Um, and we have what we call big pipe mode, which is blatantly stolen from uh, Facebook, and the approach is cooperative booting. The server boots up the same application in Fastboot that the client is booting up, but as the client is booting up, it doesn't make API network requests. The server does that and inlines them into index.html. And Chad dives in and describes exactly how we built that, and it looks a little bit like this, and so we end up with a code block inside of the application uh, that appears inside of index.html, and we overwrite Ajax. Really clever, there are four links down here, um, and also that says such web scale down at the bottom. <laughs> so, uh, following up with uh, continuing with, following up with continuing with, et cetera, uh, you're building a distributed system was a talk given by Mike Pack, and the idea is when you're actually building an Ember application or any single page application, we are actually building distributed systems now. State has to be managed in three different uh, kind of perspectives. You've got completely ephemeral in-memory state. You've got local state uh, inside of the actual browser. Say it's a cookie, say it's local storage. Or you have permanent state that has been written to disk on the server. All three of these states need to be maintained, kept consistent, and then you've got all sorts of the fun problems that come with uh, CAP. You actually need to start thinking about these problems now that we're uh, talking about Ember as a persistent, long-running, offline application. We want to make this easier for you. And so he's got this uh, pretty little picture that shows how Ember data can actually serve as a good uh, approximation of each of these three states. So, uh, Ray Tiley uh, works out in uh, Portland, Maine. Um, <laughs> uh, and he works for a, a company that had two teams. One team was building an ASP.NET application and They'll be damned if that thing isn't going to just die and they're going to replace it and they're going to burn it with fire and start from scratch anew. Well, he's arguing that doing a full Big Bang rewrite will uh, rapidly expand, fill all of the entire space, which is kind of what the premise of the Big Bang is. Um, so the idea is, you know, what if instead you are actually slowly but incrementally rebuilding an application? And eventually you build an Ember app, and so he describes the process of building an Ember application that eventually wraps the existing application, and that gives your customers value immediately, even during the process of the rewrite. And slowly but surely, pieces are getting ripped out, and there's less .NET code and more Ember code, and everything ends up nice and happy. And then he describes 
ambitious projects is not being about the actual complexity, because all of us feel like we're building complex applications, but also the time frame. I, let's say maybe 10 uh, weeks ago, opened up a Rails app that was created pre 1.0, got it running, and moved it to Rails 4. Uh, an ambitious project has to do with the time frame, and I think that's something that Ember is well suited for with our LTS strategy, and that's what Ray was trying to communicate in this talk. Uh, Matt McKenna, uh, he built a game in Ember.js uh, starring his cat. His cat's name is, uh, okay, hold on, uh, Croissant. And it's a really cute white cat. Um, and. Uh, the idea is that building JavaScript applications is actually mundane. Like what we do as a group of people is build the same thing over and over and over again. Who likes writing build pipelines? Steph, keep your hand down. <laughs> uh, that was approximately the response I would expect. But Ember's got, got your back. So, hmm, who likes building uh, testing frameworks? Okay, so if you're actually building a game, you have to think about all of the asset pipeline, you have to think about testing, you have to think about all of these things, but instead of doing that, you could just defer that to some framework. And that comes back again to Ember as an SDK for building things for the web. So he built an application in Ember starring his cat. It just happened to be a game. He used uh, services for doing the game loop, uh, and you know, testing a game, you're often imagining like who was excited as a kid and like, I'm gonna go be a video game tester. That's gonna be my job when I grow up. Cause that seems like a dream job, right? Well, what if you could actually write unit acceptance and integration tests for your video game? All of your childhood dreams <laughs> have just evaporated. <laughs> but he does walk through how to write those tests. And so this is what the game looks like, and it's actually a runner. I uh, think uh, the uh, T-Rex game inside of Chrome. And some of you have no idea what the T-Rex game is inside of Chrome, and you're going to look it up, and it's going to be the best day of your life. <laughs> um, after that, we had Ivan Vanderbilt, uh, who is an Australian, and so he did a nice little slide where he put Australia upside down so that we're looking down on it, because uh, that's what we do up in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and he's talking about how to build visualizations in order to improve our understanding of data. And the goal is that we want to uh, build rails, but we don't want to necessarily give you the maximally flexible API, because the maximally flexible API looks like a series of properties, and this is the feature Jim wanted. This is uh, my boss's whim on Sunday morning. I got a phone call at 3 a.m., and so I just added this property instead um, of actually solving the real problem. These are all things that I'm sure you've seen in your applications. So our idea is to take it and actually create a new a uh, paradigm where everything is declarative. So even Mike Bostock has discovered that the old approach for D3, which was very imperative one after the next after the next, is not necessarily the best approach, especially for our new data binding world. Um, and he's now come up with Ember CLI, or excuse me, D3 Shape, which is a construction library. It does all of the math, it does all of the scales, and then you can just have it spit out the definition for the line and get that fed back into your data binding library. So uh, that is something like this. So this is known as uh, the actual grammar of graphics. So top to bottom, we've got data, which uh, comes in from the route, gets loaded in. You can transform it in the controller or, say, in a component itself, um, depending upon how you build your application. Uh, you actually have the uh, D3 math coming in to handle the scales. The coordinates are something that you would draw based upon that math from the chart component. Uh, you would build your own component. Uh, or you could actually go through the uh, process of using his thing, which is called maximum plaid. 
Um, and for those of you who actually enjoy space balls, um, <laughs> that's a reference. <laughs> uh, last off, we had easy bake te testing. Also, cupcakes. There are cupcakes in the back, and they are fantastic. Uh, please get some before you leave. We don't want any of us to have to take them home. Um, so, I. Uh, we have Liz Bailey, whose name I'm probably butchering, and she describes exactly what the answers to all of these questions are. Uh, so in case you had any questions at all about testing, like what do I need to do uh, out of the box with Ember? Basically nothing. Thank you, Ember CLI. How do I use Ember CLI's built-in test helper? Well, there are docs online. Uh, but she does a whole much better whole bunch better job explaining like the reasoning and how we got to this situation all the mistakes that we've made along the way, and how to use these tools themselves. And so she discusses Mirage. She discusses our uh, test them integration. She discusses integration unit and acceptance tests, uh, and even describes what the difference is between an integration test and an acceptance test. Um, and she even dives into things like Ember Sign-On and other tools that you can use for mocks, stubs, and spies. And so that was Liz Bailey's talk. And that one, coming in at a brief 20 minutes, was possibly the shortest and most valuable 20 minutes in my uh, recap of the <laughs> uh, conference. And up next, we have Mr. Stefan Penner, Stefan, who I butchered his name because I'm a pro. <laughs> well, apparently these Cupcakes are going to go like hotcakes. <laughs> I'm taking my own with. <laughs> you guys can't have this one. All right. Um, so there's this dude, Steph. He gave a talk about Ember CLI again for like the third time. Third Fourth? I don't know. Um, okay. So initially, I spoke about the history of Ember CLI. We came from this thing called BPM, went through Rake Pipeline, Ember Tools, Ember App Kit, which was great and horrible at the same time, and Ember CLI, which collectively as a community have we've made pretty cool. Uh, we've done so by being pretty relentless about different types of quality, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. Um, we, we have set the bar for the quality of dev tools in this domain, and others are following, which is great. Um, UX is important, and oftentimes people forget about the developer experience. So I coined a horrible phrase called DX, and then I found out that that's actually like an entirely, it's like companies have departments that are actually called DX. <laughs> so I didn't coin anything, I'm just a copycat. Um, and I gave a stat summary of interesting stats. So at the time of the conference, these are the stats for Ember CLI. Um, these aren't just vanity metrics, but rather they're incentives and encouragement. So if more people contribute, you actually have a big impact. So since it was created, 100 million live reloads, you can make live reloads slightly faster, you make it faster for a bunch of people, it's totally worth your investment. So if I was pitching to VCs to invest in me, they would see, hey look, it's worth our investment. So I'm pitching to you to contribute to here because it's worth your investment. All right. Uh, we talked a little bit about what, what worked well, what didn't work well, uh, and what's next, and the most important part is what's next, and that is, Apps are very big. At the EmberConf, there are at least 10 or 20 people that came up to me and said, so my app's like 50 megs. You've got to do something about this. So the first thing is bundling, the ability to split up your application. Not just naively splitting every little thing, but rather giving people slabs of application that can be predictably isolated without all the caveats. That's bundling. The goal is for it to work with async engines together. Async engines and Ember CLI will be able to do this more or less automatically for you. Uh, the next thing is Ember CLI got a core team. Uh, this is to scale uh, development. The project has grown and continues to grow um, because of, well, when you're dealing with many people's computers, strange things happen. Like, for example, it took three weeks to just figure out how to do uh, automatic port detection across all of the operating systems that we thought. I thought it was like, grab a node module, put it in, done, but it wasn't. Um, so luckily, that was a wonderful contributor who worked on that. Um, and we just need more help because making the stuff nice Stuff nice takes a lot more time than expected. Next one is fixing base href. Anyone here know base href? Yeah, those guys love it. It's supposed to work. Basically, the browsers and HTML are broken, so we're going to fix it by brute forcing it. Um, better dependency management, better extension points for now <coughs> commonly seen 
uh, extension usages and add-ons that we didn't see before. And uh, finally, just continue to enable more contributors to the Ember add-on ecosystem and to Ember CLI itself. Uh, OK, Lauren Tan, idiomatic Ember. All right, so, so choices are hard. And by having strong conventions, having strong idioms, Ember prevents you from making choices that don't matter and said, let you focus on choices that matter with your application. This is important. So her talk was great. I really recommend looking at it. I won't do justice here, but I'm going to give a couple things that I thought were super important. In the Ember way, data downs, action up. It's good. But the important part isn't this. The important part is this. Only the owner can modify something. This is nice. You can coordinate. Services are where you put long-lived state. Components are where you put ephemeral state that you don't really care about, but it maybe matters for the life cycle of the component. If your component has state that needs to live longer, like you have a row that needs to be expanded, you navigate away, come back, it needs to still be expanded, probably needs to live here. Data down actions up enables this nicely. It's a nice mechanism by which you can communicate. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the next part is uh, controller. She said controllers are dead. Um, what this actually means, and what she explained was, controllers basically have become routes. Controllers have become view plus controller, which is a component. And controllers may become something that decorates an outlet. A common name that's been used for this is routable components. We'll see what it becomes. Um, the next part of idiomatic Ember is really, rather than doing imperative code in your components and views and stuff, Utilize the declarative templates. They're a mechanism by which you can rely on the unknown unknowns being handled for you automatically. So closure actions are awesome. Use them, learn them, enjoy them. And in places in your template where handlebars just doesn't cut it, help, helpers are the way that you can put in arbitrary Turing complete JavaScript code to accomplish something. Here's a quick example. This is a helper. It adds equal to handlebars. People have in the past asked for wait. Tons of features now they can just add their own, which of course is lovely. All right. Um, next talk, Katie Gengler. She is the one of the wonderful creators of emberobserver.com. Who here has used emberobserver.com? All right. Who has heard of it but not used it? All right. You guys who didn't put up your hand, go to emberobserver.com. It is a sibling to emberaddons.com. And what it does is it reviews add-ons. It assigns scoring to them so that when you're deciding which add-on you need to use, which select component you want to use, you can actually see which one has the highest score. Um, the scores are derived on the next slide. I will show you. Uh, some interesting facts from her side of the world, that is, the side of, can we make these add-ons better? How are these add-ons working? Can we improve this? Is since 2014, we have created 2,632 add-ons. In that, there are less that are real and worthwhile and active uh, and intended for public use. People have accidentally public, published private ones. <laughs> Some are inactive. This is fine. And um, it turns out that Adolfo wrote a really great book that inspired many people to create, um, oh, what's the name of the? Ember CLI 101. No, oh. the, the add-on. Phil bought. Murray. The Phil Murray add-on. So there's actually like 400 Phil Murray add-ons. <laughs> actually to the UIs of both Ember Observer and Ember. Uh, <laughs> so like the book is successful. It's doing well, except that as part of the process, people hit Ember NPM publish. <laughs> UIs for Ember add-ons.com and emberobserver.com actually just filter out Phil Murray. <laughs> uh, anyway, so so she, she actually... She and her, her team, they actually perform this analysis on the ecosystem in order to convey good information to the, the user base. All right. So actually, in reality, we still actually have a lot of active projects. There's about 1,500 active projects, 700 maintainers, and to those, there's been about 2,000 contributors, which is awesome. Uh, Ember Observer scoring is basically there to help people make good choices and also to encourage existing add-on authors to make good choices. Um, she also wrote an add-on called Ember Try, which lets you run your add-on with many different versions of Ember, many versions of all your NPM and node modules and Bower components. So you can actually have an add-on that's tested in CI against all of the versions of Ember you can use. And it turns out, I didn't know this, but the top 100 add-ons their group, or the Ember Observer team, actually automatically runs them against Canera, Canary, Beta, and um, every release as they happen, so that they can inform users quickly if there's an issue with one of these. 
I think we should probably connect into this so we know when we broke something. Um, <laughs> probably do it all the time. All right. Okay, this is a pretty cool talk by uh, Chris Lowell, and um, this is how you can use immutability. Um, so he describes his history of getting into Ember. He loved Backbone. Backbone allowed him to describe his world as entities, the relationships between the entities, and it was great until it wasn't. And then Ember was great. Uh, and it actually turned out for him that they had Backbone code and they just started using the Ember object model in Backbone because Ember object was a better Backbone object. Um, and it was great until it wasn't. Um, and basically, the point that he came up with was, in many cases, it's actually hard to define all the dependencies so that the traditional KVO model in Ember could work, uh, especially in complicated forms. So he was sad, and he looked for something else to solve this problem, and he found Ohm, which is a closure library, and Omniscient, I guess, which is a JavaScript port of this, or variant of it. And he realized mutability is pretty awesome. But he still wanted to use Ember, which is great. He didn't want to use, didn't want to do the backbone thing of just dropping it, because Ember provides so many useful things. And what he discovered in this experience was Ember and immutability just kind of work. It's just a mental model shift. Um, so the way he describes immutability and how it's useful for building UIs is think about it like a movie where each frame is an immutable state and your application becomes basically a stream of immutable states. So given a template, this is how you would introduce immutability into your application where it was required. If you couldn't figure out all the dependency keys, it was too complicated, given a template, you'd find all of the stateful bindings in that template you would extract it into an object, and every time any of the inputs to that object changed, you would just replace the entire object and all of the descendants would just re-render or just recompute. And there's no need to wire up all of the dependent keys, it just works. And with Glimmer, this works extremely well. And in many cases, this is just the right thing to do. In other cases, you want the higher granularity, but where it just gets too complicated, you might just say, I don't care about the granular updates, I'm just gonna do this and let Ember figure out the most efficient way of accomplishing it. Um, so basically on change we get a new frame or object of state of the movie and Ember just does the same thing except in really complicated cases we don't have to deal with really hard to debug somewhat brittle confusing things. All right so Xavier Kamba talked about being able to incrementally migrate an application. So he works for a company, big application. Um, they wanted to transition into a single page application and said, okay, let's do this. But they have features to ship. They can't just stop development. And if you, who here's built version two of a version one product that exists in reality? Who hasn't done this? Yeah, I don't know about um, Basically what happens is version one keeps progressing and version two may never catch up and bad things happen. So. He said, hey, what if instead we can slowly evolve the application to become an uh, Ember and whatever it is, and eventually it will evolve to be entirely an Ember app. And the approach he wanted to take was one that followed as many idioms as possible using Ember CLI, all these fun things. Um, so what he found out is you can get all of the conventions, all of the fun things, and it isn't actually as scary as expected. So some considerations. Um, and that is, remember that the outside world, other jQuery spaghetti, it will probably cause you some grief. So you might have to be very aware of this. And the other way to think about it is your app, or the parts of your app that are displayed, can be thought of as a really big component. And if your communication from legacy app to new app is data down, actions up, great things happen. Um, now, in communication from the one app to the Ember app, it turns out that Ember's fast food API and Ember's testing API allow you to remote control your Ember app and deterministically know when it completes. So now it's relatively easy to combine the two worlds in something that's deterministic. And if your Ember tests pass, then this will work and your fast boot will work. So it's kind of using existing idioms to accomplish this. All right, and finally, the last talk that I will be doing is James Kyle's excellent talk on how to build a compiler. And he starts off with basically saying, I'm going to read it. I understand compiler, I understood compilers abstractly, but did not really, really know. That is until I saw the six to five code base, and basically when he read it, he's like, ah, now I understand it's nowhere near as scary as I thought it would be, and that's great. But then later on, as he worked 
on 6 to 5, which became Babel. Babel became very big, but they had no contributors, and he was kind of thinking about why. And basically what it boils down to is people teach compilers in ways that are really, really scary and really, really boring, and it doesn't need to be. <clears throat> so uh, the rest of the talk is in two pieces. One is a brief summary of what a compiler does. Compiler takes code, parses it, transforms it, generates more code out of it. It's pretty simple. I mean, like, you can make it as, as complicated as you want or as simple as you want. Um, and he set out to actually build the world's smallest compiler for his talk. And he gave up because he realized that was actually very hard to do until he started learning about Lisp languages and realized that it would be actually relatively straightforward to create a Lisp to JavaScript compiler. And I highly recommend um, that you watch his video because he goes through the whole compiler in a really well, well rehearsed, well curated manner. And also, he published the whole thing well annotated, almost basically as a book, uh, at his GitHub address here. And I highly recommend you guys. Just take a look. It'll be fun. And that was, it looks so similar to mine. I wasn't quite sure. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, home stretch. Um, all right. So this talk was given by Jade Applegate. Um, it was about. Uh, she works at Fastly. It was about their process of redesigning and rewriting their consumer-facing app um, in Ember and kind of the whole process that she went through in doing so. Um, she kind of followed this approach of uh, the rationale approach, the results they got, and the lessons learned. Um, the rationale, contrary to some of the other talks that uh, it sort of denounced the Big Bang rewrite. Uh, she felt that the scope had changed so much, the IA, IA design had changed so much, um, and they had so many deficiencies in their current architecture that it was worth just doing a complete rewrite. Um, so the the way that they handled that was first to learn Ember. They actually like got consultants, took courses, uh, read up on it, and learned Ember pretty well. Um, and they, they took the time to test first. They made sure that they had tests and all the, everything they did from the start so that uh, they didn't fall behind on it and it fell by the wayside and uh, made sure they were using all modern tools. And everything. So uh, they were very uh, structured in how they approached it. The results kind of speak for themselves in terms of what it means to use an Ember app, right? Uh, you get the rapid development, all the rich applications and reusable components, <coughs> testing. Uh, basically, it just improved every step of their workflow and uh, really made a big difference. Um, learned a lot of lessons along the way in terms of um, how important it is to stay up to date with your dependencies uh, and make sure everything is, uh, you know, not falling by the wayside. So you get that more technical debt. Um, and on that point, she mentioned uh, that they they really try to pay down their technical debt as they go so they don't get in a hole that they can't get out of later. Um, they're really selective with their external libraries. Uh, and like I said, they use tests from the start. And um, so, yeah, they had a great experience. This is a great talk, I think, for anyone who's considering whether or not they should use Ember or maybe what that process looks like and you know what the benefits may be if they do. All right, next up is... Uh, <laughs> The Future of Ember Templating, which was given by Gafu Chan and Yehuda Katz. This one was kind of a deep dive into Glimmer 2, um, whereas the keynote kind of mentioned the, uh, the advancements and in, in performance it made. This jumped right into the technical details. Uh, in fact, the first slide was a disclaimer saying that it probably won't help you in your job, and it's super technical, and you should probably go to the other talk. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I stayed, so, and it was definitely technical. Um, but the main idea around it was uh, uh, how they used references and validators, essentially, are the building blocks of Glimmer 2, and how they're used to determine whether or not dynamic data should be updated or not in a more uh, optimized way than we currently have. Uh, and the results uh, he mentioned in the keynote are pretty fantastic. Um, Yehuda went into some of the optimizations that they are currently working on and also that are coming down the pipe, um, such as constant optimization. So if you 
if you have a constant that you're passing down uh, and you know it's a constant, then they don't bother checking it on changes. You know you're not going to have to refresh it. Um, there's inlining and specializ specialization, which is basically if you have a very simple component that could possibly be rendered at build time rather than run time, they will do it at build time uh, just to save, save speed once you're running it, your app. Um, there's also so, chunk rendering, which is basically uh, just the ability to yield control back to your browser while your app's running uh, so that uh, you're not just stuck waiting after you uh, perform an action for your app to finish processing whatever it's doing. Um, and then there's some uh, optimizations on rehydration, which is uh, based on like server-side rendering, how you update the data after it's been served. Um, and then he, he mentioned uh, the possibility of Ember Native, uh, Glimmer 2, you know, provides that possibility. Not that he was working on it at that point, but, um, you know, Glimmer 2 will make a lot of cool stuff uh, available to us. So, the great thing is that we don't have to do anything to use Glimmer 2. It's just when it, when it lands, you just use it. So, if you're looking for a talk to tell you, like, how to get the most out of Glimmer 2, you can skip this. <laughs> if you really want to know how Glimmer 2 works and it is making everything better, you'll probably want to watch this. Uh, following that, Matthew Beal gave a great talk, I thought, on um, interoperable component patterns. Uh, in contrast to the last talk, this is something that you can probably implement in your code right now. Um, he started off by kind of going over what patterns mean. Um, and not that they're specific um, solutions to problems, but more like uh, ideal outcomes that we're trying to achieve. And that um, you can apply patterns, uh, best patterns, to how we write components so that they can be used between all these different frameworks, right? Like, um, ideally, you could write a component that will work as HTML, DOM, uh, React, Angular 1, and 2, and Ember. Um, so it's pretty cool. The, the three patterns that he really suggested uh, that we follow are one using custom elements uh, via a polyfill. Uh, currently, you can't implement custom elements in any browser other than Chrome, I think. But using a polyfill like Xtag or Polymer will give you that ability. Uh, so we can start doing that now. The other pattern, the second pattern was uh, to pass attributes into your component and then deserialize them into properties. Um, some of this gets a little technical, so I'm not going to go into all the details, but watch it. Um, and the third pattern is to use events to communicate uh, with your components. Uh, so I thought it was a very good talk and definitely something that we can start doing now, so definitely take a look. Okay, I also, uh, so I did the, the mini talks here. So I have five talks that I'm going to get through real quick. <laughs> so if any of them sound good, just check them out. They're like three to eight minutes or something. Um, but Liz Tom gave a talk on JavaScript call stacks. So if you've ever been kind of confused or fuzzy on that, she does a great visual uh, guide to that, which is pretty cool. Um, Gaurav Munjal gave a talk on Ember Twiddle and the updates that have been made to that recently. Um, like pods is no longer the default folder structure, um, although you can switch between it in a config file. Um, you can now save Twiddles. Uh, there's a like whole page where you can see your saved ones. Uh, testing is now in Twiddle, and um, it's easier to paste your gifs into Twiddle. So cool stuff. Uh, ben Holmes gave a talk on accessibility in Ember, uh, specifically uh, mentioning the Ember accessibility plugin that was written by him and our very own Nathan Hammond. Um, I think this is one of the only talks at Ember that really focused just on accessibility, uh, which is a little bit of a shame because it was so short, but it was a great talk. He actually used the plugin to illustrate how dynamic sections of your page can uh, be accessible and use a screen reader to show that. Uh, actually in action. It's live on emberobserver.com right now. It is. 10 out of 10, right? No, um, no, as in Ember Observer uses it. Oh, right. So the, the demo he gave was uh, actually Ember Observer uh, using it. It was pretty cool. Um, 
So Xander Dumain gave a talk on web uh, RTC, uh, which is basically uh, just talking about how great video chat is, real-time video chat, and how we should leverage it to make great communication tools. Uh, so just beyond the big guys, like we can be using this now as well. Um, then last but not least, Ricardo Mendez gave a talk on the new Ember Learning Team and um, what's been going on there for the last uh, year or so and, and all the improvements they've been making, the feedback they've gotten, and then what they're going forward with, uh, what they're going to try to do upcoming. And um, it was some really good stuff. Uh, he had quite a few slides, so I'd definitely check that out too. Uh, yeah, so this talk I actually really enjoyed because I, I, in former life I was a designer, and this uh, this talk by Lisa Gringle and Francesco Novi, um, who work at this company Cropster, um, one's a designer, one's a developer, and they they give this talk Ember between design and development, which really was um, how they collaborate and how they work together and how the two roles uh, should and do kind of overlap. Uh, they argued that designers should be able to code and developers should be able to, to design, um, which I'm totally in favor of. And the re reasoning being that better collaboration equals a better product. They gave this kind of a analogy of if you have someone designing just a car uh, on their own um, and then someone designing like the wheels separately for it, you know, you have these different use cases in mind, and something a car that was meant to be in the city may end up with these gigantic monster truck wheels and stuff. So it's like it's worth it for you to mesh and overlap. Um, a lot of how they recommended doing that was through documentation. Uh, they actually have like three different forms of documentation that they use. Um, one is code docs, which I think most people do uh, using something like UE Doc, just to uh, generate code documentation. Um, but they also have a living style guide that they use a broccoli living style guide for that generates just their CSS classes, um, just their styles, uh, which is pretty cool. But then they also have this idea of a component guide, which they either run in small apps, they just have a series of routes where they throw this up and, and they, you can actually interact with their components that they, they build in the app. Uh, on larger ones, they said they break it out into an add-on and run it in a just a lightweight, uh, thin app where you can see all the components. Uh, and it's just installed in their production app in this, uh, this app. So any changes to it are uh, very cool. I would definitely recommend it if you uh, have at least any interest in design. <laughs> all right. And the last one was a closing keynote by uh, Oren Tyke, which was basically uh, answering the question about like, what does it mean to build ambitious web apps? What does it mean that Ember, that that's why we use Ember and everything? And he does so through this uh, long analogy uh, com comparing Chicago in the late 19th century to the JavaScript community today. <laughs> it was kind of like, I wasn't sure where he was going with it, but it ended up making sense. Um, basically, in the late 1800s in Chicago, things were insane. <laughs> and, uh, they had like all these sewage problems and stuff, and, and their way of fixing it, these guys got together and said, let's jack up the city, um, because the sewer system wouldn't work because the city was flat. So like, we'll, we'll jack up the city, and then it won't be. Um, and that kind of worked for like 10 or 20 years, until it didn't anymore, because they <laughs> just had all this filth going into the water supply and the lake. So they said, oh, OK, if all of our all of our shit's going into the lake, then we'll just uh, reverse the flow of the river. So they actually like got together, and I don't even know how they did it. It was like $23 billion in today's money or something. And they reversed the flow of the river so that you know all the waste was going down to like St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> But, the, but the, the message here is that these guys are like super ambitious, and uh, as he said, I had a lot of moxie. Um, and so the, the comparison here is that you do the same thing with Ember. And these company chose to use it. <laughs> and not crap all over St. Louis, but like, I <laughs> solve tough problems. Uh, and he said, so there are the, kind of these four reasons why he chose it, uh, because it's opinionated, which means that someone's already thought through how to solve uh, these tough problems, so you spend less time focusing on that. 
Uh, it's well documented and with the learning team that's only getting better. <coughs> Super performant and uh, trust was the main thing that he said, which was that using it, not only do you know that it's going to work today, but that the Ember community is going to make it better as we go forward. And so um, using Ember, it's kind of a guarantee that your app's only going to get better with time. So that's EmberConf 2016. All right. Wow. Okay. So we went at almost exactly an hour. So that was double the time that we were going to try to go. So we're going to need Glimmer 3 to speed up next year's recap by 2x. Um, but, uh, but yes, so thanks very much uh, to everybody involved uh, in the recap. Hopefully you guys learned a bunch about EmberConf, those of you who didn't go, um, and you have some ideas and uh, you know perhaps a to-do list of videos to watch. Um, we're going to be publishing these slides uh, shortly, so we'll, there'll be links in the meetup group. So if you want to uh, share these slides with your coworkers or your friends, they can also very quickly recap. This talk was recorded, so we'll be posting it on YouTube as well. Um,